Good evening and welcome to St. Mark's 2020 online Christmas Eve worship service. I'm Dan Metzger. I'm one of the pastors here at St. Mark's and we are so glad that you are able to join us wherever it is you are joining us from. Uh, we know that this is a Christmas Eve unlike any that we have experienced before, but I truly believe this will be a great opportunity for us, no matter where we might be, to worship the Christ child who was born for us on this day. So a couple of things I want to let you know about uh, before we begin. First, if you did not have a chance to come through our drive through live nativity and receive communion elements or a candle, we're going to be using both of those things at the end of the service. So I would encourage you right now to pause this video and to find whatever it is that you might have that could work as uh, communion elements, something like bread and grape juice that you could use, and then also uh, candles that you might be able to light with us as we all light our candles at the end of the service. And you'll see some pictures of some of uh, the church family here at St. Mark's. And I would love to see your pictures of you and your family lighting your candles in your own home as you worship with us. No matter where you might be, I believe that God is in this place and in all places where we gather together to worship. And so at this time, I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy our Christmas Eve worship service. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captivity. Well, this is it. This is the night when we celebrate the long-awaited Savior, when we celebrate the arrival of hope. And if there's anything that we need right now, it's hope. This is a weary world. We have been dealing with difficulty and pain and loss all year long, it seems like. I don't know if I've ever seen a world so tired and weary and just worn out worried about sickness, worried about loss of family, loss of income, loss of jobs, just loss of ability to be together. It's hard. This is a hard time. And it feels like we've been dealing with this forever. Of course, in reality, it's been less than a year. When Mary was visited by the angel, it had been 400 years since God had spoken through his prophets. It had been a time where uh, it was just a period of silence, really. The people had left captivity in Babylon and were told that there was going to be a Messiah on the way, somebody who would come and would rescue God's people, that it was going to happen any day now. And so every day they woke up expecting hoping, wondering, is this the time? Is it going to be now when God comes and rescues and redeems and restores everything? And every day for 400 years, they were disappointed. It just wasn't the right timing yet. God seemed to be far off. 
And now they were under a time where the Romans had occupied the region and were extorting taxes from everyone. King Herod was ruling in Judea as just really a puppet of the Roman Empire, and he was no better. It was hard. This was a time where it felt like if the Messiah was going to come, it'd be great if he came now, but this just doesn't feel like God even sees us or hears us right now. And it's in the middle of all of this that an angel comes to a girl, a child, who is put under the weight of 400 years of hopelessness. And she's the one who receives this message that Mary, now it's time. And hope is going to arise through you. Do you think she was skeptical? Maybe that's putting it mildly. Or, or did the angel have to appear to someone with the very literal faith of a child, someone who could easily be reminded that nothing is impossible with God. Maybe this was a message that the priests, the rabbis, the kings, the leaders, that they just couldn't hear and believe, that it was just too far-fetched for them to think that God not only could act right now, but even wanted to, even saw them, even heard them, even cared about them. I shared earlier this year that one of my very favorite Christmas songs is the song, Oh Holy Night. There's this beautiful line in it that says, a thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices. It was in the middle of this weariness, this hopelessness, that God came and through an angel announced that the time was now here, that yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. And I'm so glad that it's not human intellect or will or knowledge or wisdom that helps to determine when and how God is going to act. God is the master potter who's molding his creation and, and building us into exactly what he has always meant for us to be. He is the one working behind the scenes, the great artist creating something that we cannot imagine ourselves and birthing into us a new and glorious morn that is beyond our imagination to see. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel to the town of Nazareth in Galilee. And he appeared to a virgin, and uh, she was to be married to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of David, and her name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled by the sight of the angel, and she wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't worry. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you'll name him Jesus, and he will be great. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How can this be, said Mary? Mary because uh, I'm a virgin and the angel answered the Holy Spirit will come to you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God even Elizabeth who is now in her sixth month of pregnancy was told she was too old to have a baby and six months later She's with child. For no word from God will ever fail. 
I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May your word be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. stars are brightly shining it is the night of our dear Savior's birth long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth A thrill of hope The weary world rejoices For yonder breaks A new and glorious morn
sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we let all within us praise his holy name Christ is the Lord oh praise issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius, the governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and, he was, and they were expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. The other day I was looking around trying to count the number of nativity scenes in our house. We have a lot. It's one of the things that my wife Holly likes to do is collect nativity scenes and actually my kids have gotten in on it too. They uh, make their own nativity scenes and we have everything from really nice ones made out of olive wood from Bethlehem to magnets of cartoon looking versions on the wall that have cats and dogs in the nativity scene and even some that are that are just homemade ones that we've made ourselves. And the problem is, is that I'm somebody that I love history and I love uh, things that are biblically and historically accurate. And our nativity scenes aren't always biblically and historically accurate, right? There probably weren't cats and dogs uh, at the nativity scene. There might have been, we don't know. But, you know, also, yeah, it wasn't quite as stable and all these things. And so I'll look at a nativity scene and I'll say, well, actually, and nobody likes that. Nobody likes somebody who's correcting their nativity scene. But our nativity scenes tend to be happy and playful and wondrous and, and romantic looking. And the more I learn and study about the nativity itself, uh, about that night, that first Christmas itself, the more I realize it really, it wasn't like that, right? It started with a census trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem that they had to take that was going to be about paying taxes, right? That's not fun. There's nothing fun about that. And this is a pregnancy that was planned by God, but certainly wasn't planned by them. It wasn't something that they had been hoping for at this point in their lives. They weren't ready yet for this. And so they have to go back to Bethlehem, to Joseph's hometown, where more than likely it would have been Mary, a young girl, her first time meeting members of Joseph's own family. Uh, not exactly the way she was planning on meeting the in-laws. There was nowhere for them to stay, either by... Uh, just the happenstance that there were a lot of people in town or 
that they weren't necessarily welcomed anywhere because this pregnancy to those who didn't hear from the angel, this pregnancy seemed pretty scandalous. This was a hard time. There was nowhere for them to stay. There's, they're put in a place where there's a manger, so we can assume, a manger being a feeding trough, we can assume that there's animals there. And where there's animals, it's generally not very clean. It's a first century parking garage for all intents and purposes. And I wonder if that made things tense. I wonder if Joseph, you know, was hoping for hospitality with his family and in finding this maybe had words with some of them. I wonder if it was uncomfortable if Mary cried tears of disappointment and heartache. And yet, this is the place that we celebrate, that we idealize, that we remember. Not for how ideal it was, but for the beauty God brought forth from it. Hope came into the world in the least likely of ways and in the least likely of places. So maybe nativity sets are beautiful not because that's the way it was, but because that's the way God made it. He turned a feeding trough into a throne for his only son, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he turned a disappointment into a destination for all those who would worship him.
That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped in snugly strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was a baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. And Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. And I'm sure in some way, every new mother treasures the birth of their child in this way. But let's be honest, for Mary, the night had been less than ideal. It was dirty. It was embarrassing even, uh, painful. And she was lonely. She wasn't with her family and her friends surrounded by the people that she knew. She was in a strange place. It was not exactly scrapbook worthy. And to top it all off, suddenly, a group of strange men that she had never met before come busting in to her sorry excuse for a delivery room, talking about angels and, and that they're singing. And I, I wonder if she was just totally taken aback by all of this until she heard one of the shepherds say that the angel had told them, do not be afraid. It was the same message the angel had given Mary some nine months before. Don't be afraid, Mary. And then one of the shepherds would have said that the angels told them that this child, this baby was the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord. And that he was the one who had come to save his people from their sins, just as the angel had told Joseph all those months before. And she looked at these men she would have remembered the words of the prophets as they were ringing in her ears. But out of you, Bethlehem, will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. If Mary had doubts, they subsided. And so she treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. And I wonder, as she stored away these memories in her heart, if some 33 years later, they would have come back to her as she stood at the foot of the cross and watched her beloved son take his final breaths. And I wonder if she understood that he in that moment was becoming the very savior that the angels had foretold that night, the savior who was broken for us and poured out for us. And so tonight, we remember this same Jesus, this child who grew up to be not just a man, not just a great teacher, but God in the flesh who dwelled among us and came and lived and died for us. And we remember that it was on the night before his death that Jesus sat in the upper room with his disciples. And he took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks to God. And he said, this is my body, it's broken for you. As often as you eat it, remember me. And in the same way, when the meal was over, he took a cup and lifted it and gave thanks to God. And he said, this is my blood of a new covenant, a new promise poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, remember me. So friends, if you have your communion elements with you at home, 
or the closest thing you can find that resembles that, I invite you to bring those now. And would you bow your head with me? So God, pour out your Holy Spirit once again on all of us, wherever we might be gathered, and on these gifts of bread and of juice. Make them be for us, once again, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, by your power and by your spirit. Make us all one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all of the world until the day comes, the glorious day, when we will all feast at his heavenly banquet table. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forevermore. Amen. So friends, the body of Christ, broken for you. Take and eat. And the blood of Christ was poured out for you. Take and drink. God, thank you for the holy mystery in which you give yourself to us, just as you have always done, always giving yourself to us. May the grace that entered our lives on that first Christmas night, may it just flow out from us in every person that we meet, in, in every encounter we have with others, that they might know that we have a close and personal relationship with the very God who was willing to sacrifice himself because of his great love for us. God, we thank you. And we praise you that no matter where we are, because, because there is one bread, we are all one body and we are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen.
thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope that you and your family have a very Merry Christmas. And until we meet again, I pray God gives you faith and Christ gives you peace. And the Holy Spirit gives you the power to share this gospel, this good news that we celebrate of God's perfect love. Amen.